Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Heather Hansen, and we have got not one, not two, but three trials that have been going on this week here at the Law and Crime Network, and we are going to be going through some of them on this Friday. We have had this week the case of the McStay family violently murdered and taken and buried far away from their home. We'll be talking about that case. We'll also be talking about that case out of New Jersey, a domestic violence case gone very bad. But first, we want to talk to you about the Florida versus EM case. This case is one that tried once before, ended in a mistrial, but this time the jury had their chance. We are going to show you a little bit of defense openings in this case against Melanie Eon so that you can get your mind sort of wrapped around what went on in that case, and then we'll be going through it step by step. So first, let's start with those defense openings. Listen to the testimony from Guy Han that he locked all the doors from the inside, more specifically the glass door, which cannot be opened other than from the inside. Listen to the evidence of the Maryland policeman doing a welfare check and getting the answer, I'm afraid. You're going to interpret the evidence as you see fit. That's your job. You took an oath. I'm sure you'll do it well and you'll do it correctly. One question that you have to get by before you even consider Melanie is why did Guy Han pick up the bloody murder, accidental, whatever it is, the weapon with which he stabbed James Berry? So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the defense opening in that case against Melanie E.M. I want to bring in our guest today, Brian Wagner. Brian is a criminal defense attorney. So happy to have you here today, Brian. Thanks so much for having me. I want to talk to you about this plan that they had to blame the murder on Guy Hand. And you heard at the end of his opening statement, the defense attorney is talking about the fact that the Guy Hand had moved the knife. Do you think, you know, we're, we're seeing this in a couple of the cases that we've been covering, this idea of blaming someone else. Do you think that that's a good defense in these cases? I think it depends on how strong the evidence is against that other person. When I do an opening, I want to offer just basic holes in the, def in the prosecution's argument. And then once all the evidence is in, I can make my arguments. But you have to be careful. When you overcommit on an opening, the jury remembers that, and they hold you to that promise. Well, and you've almost put yourself in the position where you have the burden of proof against this unknown defendant as opposed to being on the defense and not having to maintain any burden. Absolutely. And you basically want to go through cross-examination and just establish little points that you're then going to sum up on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to show you one of the investigators in this case. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about what he had to testify to. So this is taken from inside the hallway. Uh, my back would be kind of towards the bedrooms. And that's looking out over into the kitchen to the left. And then that front door would be over where my corner is directing. You can show us on the diagram, please. So I would be standing roughly around here. And then the picture that you saw would be photographing this area here. Page 25, uh, where was this photograph shot? That's in the hallway, right at the, the edge of the, the entrance of the hallway, by the kitchen, leading over by the front door. Like the states. 32. You can tell us what vantage point this is and what two items of evidence are being shown in this photograph. Mm -hmm. The vantage point would be taken from within the kitchen, about the center of the kitchen, um, <clears throat> looking out to the front door where the evidence, I mean, where the uh, red pointer is now. There's two things on the ground that have numbers on. Uh, the number two over here, that was marked, that was used to mark uh, the clump of hair that we just talked about. Okay. And then... And let me just stay on that for a second. I show you stables 35. Does that show that clump of hair being marked with the yellow number? Yes. Then it's 37. Of course, I'll that. Yes. 
So ladies and gentlemen, you are watching the testimony of Neil Zielinski. He was one of the investigators on the scene after the murder of James Barry. We're going to watch a little bit more of his investigation and the, his testimony about the same, and we'll be back in just a minute. Out of the primary crime scene, did you proceed into the kitchen area where there was a knife uh, located? Yes. Right. Where was that knife located? The knife was located uh, on the kitchen counter, kind of as you come in from the front door and continue into the house. Did you actually document that by placing a knife in the location where you found it on the dining room? Yes, so where the laser pointer is here, that's where the knife was. Over here is the front door, you would come in, you have the hallway, and you have the knife. You <coughs> had states and evidence of states nine. Did you take that photograph, sir? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, does that show the knife as you found it? Yes, it does. Is that prior to you moving and turning it over or anything like that? Is that exactly how you found the knife? Um, in that, that picture in particular, I don't know if that knife that was moved at that point for me, but it was in that, within millimeters of that exact same block. So let's, let's back up then and look at it. This is already in evidence of State 56. What do we see in State 56? So in this photograph, you have the front door over here, and you walk in, and then the hallway to the right where the corner is, and then... The yellow thing up there that has a number one on it, that's the knife. And then you have the white thing on the floor with the number, or the letter I think it was, which is where the blood was, and then the hair at number two. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you just saw was an investigator testifying as to what it was that he found when he first arrived on the scene. I want to talk to Brian about this, because earlier this week in some of the other cases that we've been covering, we saw investigators testify without the use of exhibits, of blown up pictures, of models of the room. How do you think that works? Do you think it's of a, uh, an advantage to use those types of things, or do you think it's better not to? So there's something called the CSI effect. The TV show, CSI, everyone that sits on the jury now expects it to be like TV. You need to do something to keep them paying attention because this testimony is dry. It is boring. But you want the jury to feel as though they're in the room and they completely understand what the prosecution or the defense witnesses are explaining. So demonstrative exhibits or exhibits that take pictures of the actual scene are incredibly important. Yeah, and they did a really good job there because they took the actual pictures and then created a model based on those pictures. So now you're seeing things in 3D. You're able to almost walk yourself as a juror through the rooms that the events at issue occurred in. Now, as we know in this case, the defense's idea of a defense was to say that Guy Hand was the one that had, that had performed the murder. And we talked about this and whether or not that's a good idea. If you have a situation like that, Brian, where you do want to sort of pass the buck onto someone else without taking on the burden. Is there an easy way to do that, or is it really like walking a tightrope? It, it is walking a tightrope, because ultimately the jury needs to now no longer believe that they didn't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt as to your client, but now they need to buy into that other person. And so that's a dangerous game to play. Oftentimes, it's better just to say, look, the people didn't meet their, didn't meet their burden beyond a reasonable doubt, and they never even investigated this other person. And then you can go into it. But I like to keep it as simple as possible because you don't want jurors saying the defense didn't meet their burden because that's not the case. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we're going to hear from the victim's best friend. So stay tuned here at the Long Crime Network. What does Guy look like at that point? And does Guy come into the room um, and help you? Yes. Before um, Guy is all the way in the room, have you made it to James? Are you trying to help James? Yes. What are you doing um, to, to help James? At first, I was uh, trying to cover the room as best as I could. And I was trying to talk to him and tell him that he was going to be okay. And I was freaking out. I didn't know what was going on. And I was trying to pick him up and put him onto the bed. Um, and then Guy shortly helped me after that get him onto the bed. And I kept trying to do chest compressions. And I 
I didn't know what to do with him when I, when I saw that he wasn't breathing anymore. I, I started doing mouth to mouth. I don't know CPR. I just, I'm just trying to do anything that I could to help. And then shortly after that, I started doing compressions. And so at this point, as you're trying to render aid, um, are you in a bit of shock yourself? Yeah. Do you know what you're doing? No. Yeah. Are you still trying your best? Yes. At some point, does God take over for you? Yes. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the best friend of the victim in this murder case coming out of Florida. And that, Brian, is the type of witness that what do you do with him on cross-examination? I mean, he, what a terrible thing to have to testify about. What a terrible thing to have to live through, seeing your best friend die before your eyes, trying to help him and not being able to. Do you even bother to cross-examine someone like that? Absolutely. Yeah? You cross-examine him to corroborate pieces of your summation that you're going to have. So isn't it true you didn't see, you weren't in the room when, when the victim was stabbed? Yes. Good point. You didn't see who actually committed the stabbing, correct? Yes. In fact, you saw the victim's mother's boyfriend, Mr. Hand, take the, take the knife and wash it off, correct? Yes. And so he touched the knife, correct? And so those little things that he's not going to give any resistance right. to, you have him commit to those so that on your summation you could say, here's what we do know, A, B, C, D. Yeah, it's funny. My mentor, who taught me how to try cases, always said that from each witness you want to get one pearl. And at the end of the case, in your closing, if you can put them together into a necklace, then you can try to win the case. That's great. And to your point, with that witness, you don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be confrontational. You don't have to make him upset. But you can still get a pearl from each and every witness. Absolutely. And the way you do that is by knowing what you're going to say on your summation. And then every witness, how is this person going to help my summation? So... Before you begin the case, you have a good theory, and then every witness is supporting that theory of the case. Yeah, and it's a really good point, because I don't think everyone thinks of it that way. But if you can start from the end and then work your way backwards, then even when you write your opening, you're writing it in preparation for that final day. Now, the question then becomes, in a more global sense, mm -hmm. you're bound to have surprises at trial. They don't always go the way that you want to. So how do you deal with those surprises? Like we're just about to watch the examination of Guy Hand, who is the person that the defense is trying to blame this case on. There's going to be surprises in that testimony. How do you deal with those with the idea of your closing in mind? Well, so you even start during jury selection, you're talking about issues that are going to come up. And so the jurors are already preconditioned to accept your case. They might not want to accept it, but you at least know if they're open to it. And so when there are surprises, you tell them, look, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have the burden. But here's what the people did not prove, and that's how you attack those surprises. Yeah, and it also makes it for late nights during trial, right? Because yes, when those does. trials come up, you've now got to go back to what you're going to say in your closing, see how you can then work it in, and then attack it every day. That's one of the things about being in trial. You're in court from 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. Do you sleep at all? <laughs> Some people do. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't me either. I don't get much sleep when I'm on trial. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take you to a quick break. When we come back, as I just said, Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to go straight to that next clip. No need for a break. We're going to take you now to a clip of Guy Hand. This is the person the defense said committed this crime, so listen carefully. It appeared that he had an injury to his chest. Yes, right up here by his collarbone, somewhere around in there. And could you see, in addition to the injury, could you see that he was bleeding? Oh, yes. And based on what you saw, um, did it look like... His reaction, was he responding to you? Was he communicating? No, he wasn't communicating. Was, um, were you and Jeff trying to communicate with him? Uh, I don't really recall. I know we were both going, uh, it, it seems like we, one of us or something, said, James, James. And when that was being said, did James respond in any way? No. Did it look like James was getting weaker? Yes, it did. What, um, what do you do to try to help James? Uh, first of all, I, I, I can hear the dispatcher saying something about chest compressions. So I told Jeff, let's, let's pick him up and lay him on the bed. And we could give chest compressions. First thing I did, I felt first pulse, and he had a light pulse on his neck right here. And uh, I didn't really have a rag or nothing, but I... I covered up the hole and used my other hand to start doing chest compressions, but every time I do a compression, blood would squirt through my fingers. And 
and when you say that you put your hand over, did you put your hand over his chest where the wound was? Yes. Why'd you put your hand, why'd you apply your hand there? Try to stop the bleeding. And when you did compressions, why'd you do compressions? Uh, to keep, try to keep his heart rate going, and the dispatcher was telling me, do chest compressions. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That was Guy Hand on direct examination, Brian. So he's getting the softballs, the big watermelons thrown to him about what he did that day. If you are on the other side, the prosecutor, and you've got to prepare a witness like this, how do you prepare the witness for direct? And then how do you prepare them for really, you know, he's going to get attacked on cross-examination. So the way you prepare him for cross is you tell him these are the issues and this is what they're going to try to establish through you. Tell us what the facts are. And then they know what the issues are and they know how to answer them. But as the defense attorney, what I'm doing is even before he starts testimony, I'm going to introduce myself outside the presence of the jury and say, I'd like to talk to you. Will you talk to me? He or she will say no. Right. And then the first question is, Mr. Hand, I just met you 10 minutes ago before this jury came in. We wanted to talk. Oh. He, didn't, he didn't want to talk to me. Isn't that correct? And then you say, Mr. why do you want to talk to me? Yes. I just wanted to find out the facts. Interesting. And so it cuts him right off from the beginning. Well, it makes him uncomfortable, right? Which yes. is something that is an amazingly important part of testifying that you don't always realize is that level of sort of being on your toes and not knowing where things are coming. That's why uh, the first witness, if you can call someone as the first witness, they're probably going to be a little less comfortable than the witness at the end. Yes. Let's let's go to that cross-examination, see if they were as savvy <laughs> as you would be, Brian. We're going to watch the cross-examination of Guy Hand, and then we'll be right back. Why three fingers? You keep on stressing. Once, once I picked up the knife, I realized to myself, why did you pick up the knife? So you immediately then dropped it, correct? No, I didn't immediately then drop it. You didn't leave it where you found it, or after picking it up, dropping it as close to where you found it as possible? Why would I do that? Why would you pick it up and take it into the kitchen, walking down a hallway? Well, it didn't really belong in the bedroom laying on the floor. So I just got it out of everybody's way and I just placed it on the counter. If you only use three fingers, I guess what you're saying is you didn't want to tamper with the evidence, correct? Is that no. why you use three fingers? Yes, no. no. But which is it? You knew it was wrong, so you only used a few fingers? Or you're just so neat, you had to pick it up and bring it into the kitchen where it belonged? Which is it? I, I was just totally stressed out at the time when I picked it up with the three fingers and just put it broad in the kitchen. Isn't it true that you were fed up with this on-again, off-again relationship and you went and got a knife to convince Melanie that she need to leave and not come back? No. Isn't it true that James Barry defended his girlfriend against what you were doing and what you were saying? No. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we just watched a little piece of the cross-examination of Guy Hand, such an important part of the defense in this case. And I was watching Brian's body language during that cross-examination, and you were not overly impressed with the theory, right? No. First of all, any trial attorney knows their case through and through. And so my, my problem with this cross-examination is you want him to commit to small little things. Don't go for those big swings, those home runs. You're not going to get them. Right. And so in terms of this witness, I'd be asking... You and the victim didn't get along. You guys had fights. And I'd bring up every single time they ever had a small argument. Because you want to create a motive for why Guy Hand actually killed him and not the girlfriend. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I thought that Guy Hand handled himself very well on cross-examination. He didn't falter. He had his tone. All the things, you know, you talked a little bit before the break about mm -hmm. making someone uncomfortable. And part of that discomfort then allows them to have body language that is, mm -hmm. looks distrustworthy. And eye contact starts mm -hmm. to sort of falter. And tone of voice gets a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any of that. He didn't look. The guy hand looked pretty comfortable, pretty trustworthy, pretty sincere, pretty credible on cross-examination, don't you think? And so good preparation by the prosecution because what they told him was, look, you touched the knife. That's a big issue here. Why did you touch the knife? Yeah. And on cross-examination, Mr. Han really answered it. He said, you know, I wasn't thinking. I grabbed the knife, and then as soon as I grabbed it, I said, this was stupid, and I put it down. 
why don't you put it in the bedroom? Well, because it didn't belong in the bedroom, it belonged in the kitchen sink. But also, this is a high-intensity, dramatic moment that just happened. He just saw someone is stabbed to death. So a jury can actually latch onto that and understand why that happened. Yeah, and, and you make a really good point. Not only did the prosecution probably prepare him to that, but he's telling the truth. At least the jury decided yes. that he was telling the truth. And when you're telling the truth, you know, I oftentimes, when my clients get caught up on the minutia, I say, just mm. tell your story. Just tell it because mm. that, that puts the body language, the tone of voice, all of mm. those things just in that perfect sweet spot. Yeah. What, what do you do? I mean, you know, you when we were off air, we were talking about this defense was a difficult one for the yes. defense attorney. What do you do in those cases where you really don't have the strongest defense? You, you've mentioned it a little bit before, and I think I know what your answer is going to be, but why don't you tell me? So anytime as a prosecutor you hear the burden is really high, they really need to meet their burden, as a prosecutor you sit back and you say, I proved my case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because if you don't have a specific instance where they didn't meet their burden, and you're just saying, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, it's really high, you know you won your case. And that's what this defense is really. It's really high burden, ladies and gentlemen. Can we really think the prosecutor met it? I don't know. Yeah, it's that's uh, you always know when people yes. start talking about that burden, and that's pretty much all they talk about, yes. that that's something. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we have some very exciting things coming for you here at the Law and Crime Network. First of all, we have one the, the woman who discovered Jamie Kloss. You know, Jamie Kloss has been missing for two months. She disappeared from her home in October. She was found yesterday, and we have the hero, and I don't say that word lately, the hero who found her here with us today on the Law and Crime network. We also have the verdict in this case that we've been watching out of Florida. So stay tuned with us for both of those exciting things this afternoon. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Heather Hansen. And for the past hour or so, we have been following the Florida versus EM case, this case against Melanie EM for the murder of her boyfriend. We are now going to show you the closing arguments in that case. And then we'll be back to discuss. And then we will see what the verdict was. So let's start with the closing argument of the prosecution and how they tied all of their strings together. Now, you spoke of uh, the injury hitting the clavicle in relation um, as well as the rib. But what's, is the clavicle a strong bone? Yeah, where you've got the clavicle and the rib coming together, it's, it's the, of all the ribs and bones when we open up the chest, those are the most difficult to cut. They have the most resistance. Now, in regards to that, if someone were to hit that, would it be possible that uh, the knife that they were using would bend? It could. I've seen that only once before, but yes, it could. And in regards to <coughs> this wound, you spoke of a knife, but were all these injuries, um, these stab wounds, consistent with that of a knife? Yes. And you, it says that um, you measured it at a 7-inch deep stab wound? Correct. So from the skin surface to the furthest point that I could examine internally, it was 7 inches. And in regards to these wounds, do you also do directionality of the stab wound? Yeah, I try to do that too, to see what direction it's going, what direction the knife is going. And what about this lethal uh, stab wound? It was from his front to back, from his left to right, and slightly downward. And you spoke of this being a lethal wound. What is the effect on the body? Why is this a lethal wound? Basically, he's bleeding to death. He's bleeding outside of the body, but he's also bleeding internally. But what happens is your brain just doesn't get enough blood flow and oxygen to the brain, and he passes out. And then once he passes out, he just doesn't wake up again. And you spoke of bleeding uh, internally as well as outside. If, uh, in this case, if he had a shirt on, would the shirt contain a lot of the blood and cover the wound? Yes, it would. And was that consistent with the shirt that you saw that it appeared to have um, a large amount of blood on it? Yes, it did. Well, Brian, that clearly wasn't closings. That was one of the um, investigators, and specifically with the medical examiner, talking about the angle of the wounds and the angle of... Tell us about that type of testimony. How do you make it so that the medicine is something that the jury can really grasp onto? So it might be dry, but it's also very important because you can never get inside of someone's mind what their intent is. Here, you have to prove that she intentionally murdered this person. And so when you stab someone in the upper chest region, 
vital organs are there. And so that is your intent. Also, how did the blade go in? Where did it go in? In what direction did it go? That goes to whether or not there is a struggle. Is there a possible self-defense? And that's why, although the testimony is very dry, it's usually accompanied by pictures as well as diagrams to show what the person's intent was that actually committed the stabbing. Yeah, and it's interesting. This type of testimony oftentimes juries are interested in because they like the gory pictures and they like to understand the human body. How do you how do you play off of that? When you're talking to juries in your cases, do you talk about, you know, the carotid artery or do you talk about the blood vessel that gets the blood to your head? Do you try to make it more to the extent that it's, you can, you do, but as a defense attorney, I'm also trying to limit what video, what pictures actually come in, because they're too gory, and they're going to inflame the jury, Judge, and you want to limit it as much as possible. All right, we are going to throw you to closing arguments in this case, and then we will be back in a minute with the verdict in this case, so stay tuned. Tamper with the murder weapon. I'm still hung up with both of those was this a prosecution of Melanie Eam, or was this a defense of Guy Hand? The prosecutor has quoted 1697 poet and basically said, well, you know how women are. This is nothing new. I'm surprised that she wasn't going to be burnt as a witch. But this isn't 1697. And emotions have nothing to do with this case. The knife was thrust so hard into James Barry's chest that it bent the tip. So hard. A 90-pound woman or an iron worker? A 90-pound woman or a butcher? Now, Brian, that was the defense attorney giving his closing argument, and he made a lot of uh, references to her being a female. You know, he talked about those Salem witch trials and burning witches at the stake, and then he talked about she's 90 pounds, and able to, is she able to use the knife in such a way that it would bend? What do you think about that? So putting the Salem witch trial thing aside, the strength of the alleged murderer, or in this case, the person that they end up finding guilty, is important right. because she's a 90-pound woman and the tip of the knife gets bent. And so does she have enough force or power to do that? And that's why the medical testimony we talked about before, the fact that it goes into the collarbone, that might have caused it. On the other hand, what the defense is trying to say is, no, a very strong person, for example, a steel worker, Guy Han, yeah. must have been the one that actually plunged the knife into his body. Yeah, it's, it's a good try. It's definitely a good try. We are going to see now the verdict in this case and whether or not the defense's attempt were successful. So take a look. All right, counsel may be seated. Welcome back. Has the jury reached the verdict? If you can hand the verdict to the deputy. Ladies and gentlemen, after having had a trial that ended in a mistrial, she now has had a trial that ended in a verdict against her. 
What do you think, Brian? Do you think that that was the, the correct finding of facts by this jury? In general, I trust juries. They hear all the evidence. They take these cases very seriously, and they take their responsibility very seriously. And so when they, when they return a guilty verdict, I put a lot of weight to that. Yeah, I, I love that point because I trust juries as well. And I think that so many times, especially in the media, and that's one of the reasons that I love working at Law and Crime so much, to watch the whole trial, not bits and pieces that you've seen in the media, not bits and pieces that you've caught while you're eating your dinner and listening to the evening news, it makes a big difference. And this jury sat through all of the medical testimony, all of the witnesses' testimony. They looked at all of the DNA evidence, and they finally came to a conclusion. Now, the next step, she's supposed to be sentenced in April. What do you think about the notion of an appeal for her? So there's always... A trial judge makes a thousand decisions, and so there's always going to be little things that he or she could have done better or worse or was or wasn't right on the law. Now it comes to whether or not it is harmless error, meaning not a big deal, or if it really impacted the jury's ultimate decision. And so I'm sure somewhere along the way there's definitely errors. Now it's whether or not they're harmless or not. Yeah, and there's a number of errors that I'm sure that the defense will bring up. The confession getting in when perhaps it should not have gotten in. Some of those objections. But we'll see whether or not that's enough to overcome. We'll be keeping you posted here at the Law and Crime Network. We will certainly let you know what happens not only with Melanie's sentencing, but also with whether or not she appeals. We'll be back in a minute with the mixed day verdict. Your trial, come back with us quickly. There you have the prosecution opening in this case against Charles Merritt. He's talking about the who, the what, the where, the why, and the how. Let's go back and watch him continue with this opening, and then we'll discuss how effective that was. The who is the person who desperately tried to cover his tracks after the murders. The who is the person who, <coughs> excuse me, in attempting to cover his, his tracks, the evidence will show he misled investigators, he talked in circles, and he played the victim. The who is the person who, even after the murders, took $5,000 from Joseph's mother under the guise of completing a project and never paid her back. The who, ladies and gentlemen, is the defendant. And those lies and that misleading and that talking in circles and that playing the victim worked for a time for three, almost four years. This is the mixed days. In 2010, they lived in a town called Fallbrook. They moved into uh, the residence in November of 2009. Prior to that, the family lived for a brief period of time with Joseph's mother, Susan Blake, in the Tom's Farms area, uh, just south of Corona. Fallbrook is a town that's south of Temecula, north of Escondido, north of San Diego. They moved into the house at Avocado Vista Lane, they're near the end of a cul-de-sac, into a quiet neighborhood. <clears throat> they drove two vehicles. The green Dodge you see here in the driveway of the residence, uh, the evidence will show it was always parked there, and typically Summer drove that vehicle. The family also owned uh, this white Isuzu Trooper that Joseph primarily drove. <laughs> Joseph had a business. The business was called Earth Inspired Products. The business started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so there you have the prosecution giving their opening on a case that's going to last, as I said, months. Brian, when you have a case that's going to last months, how do you set it up so that the jury remembers everything you promise a month from now? They're not. Just flat out. They're, they're not going <laughs> to remember. Point. That's right. But what you do is you set up themes that are going to come out in this case. What the theme in this case really is is circumstantial and this is the logical person. And so talk about what the circumstances are. Forensic evidence, his DNA is in the car, the killer. His, the business partner is in uh, DNA. The cell phone site towers put the defendant at the location at important times and places when the murder investigation is going on. The 
dispute in the business, the continued fraudulent activity. All those little circumstantial pieces suggest that this is the person that killed him. But it's always going to be a circumstantial case, and the prosecution should be leaning into that, which they are, but not as effectively. You know, I think it's effective, too, to really be stressing the greed piece. You and I both looked at each other when he started talking about the why, because greed is one of those, you know, seven sins. It's one of the things that you can really look to as a juror and say, oh, yes. Do you think that re relying upon that and the human nature to rely upon that is effective? Yes. Because juries want to understand why did this occur, and greed is an easy explanation, and people understand it. You know, what, and what do you think about, you know, I think it's effective. He's talked about the who, the what, the where, the why, and the how. And that is something that jurors, even if they don't remember the minutia, they're going to remember, oh, he told us who, he told us what, he told us why. Generally, I don't like asking questions and then answering them. Just answer the question. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting, ladies and gentlemen. You'll see something a little bit more interesting when we talk about the defense openings in just a minute. So stay tuned for that. And further. No one knows that they're dead. San Diego's conducting a missing persons investigation, and he's saying Joseph was my best friend. He's saying the kids were energetic. In fact, if you notice on one clip, he corrects himself and says, Joseph always leaves, Joseph always left that light on. You'll hear the entire interview, and you'll hear that he does slip in and out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so the prosecution's opening in large part rests upon this video of the defendant. And Brian, I want to talk to you about this because we were looking at each other and sort of shaking our heads. How strong do you think that is, the fact that the defendant, when interviewed by the police in a missing persons case, referred to the missing people in the past tense? Is there something less than zero? I I put zero value into that. And as a defense attorney, I tell the jury, you should put zero value into that. There's many, many, many innocent explanations for why you're talking in the past tense. It might just be how he talks. So that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it might have been better for the defense had he been able to come up with one of those explanations. You know, because as I was listening to it, I was thinking the same thing. It could be that he was saying, well, they used to do this and they used to do that. The fact that he wasn't able to come up with it, eh. But... The prosecution relying so heavily on that in their opening statement, what does that tell you about the strength of their overall case? I think they're throwing a lot of things at the wall and seeing what will stick. But as the defense attorney, what you're going to say is, hey, gentlemen, he's being interviewed by detectives about his missing business partner. He's not thinking about his what is the proper tense. He's just trying to give them answers to their questions. Yeah, the defense opening, and we're going to watch that in just a minute, There's, they raise a lot of really interesting issues because the, the prosecution, you know, they've got the, the, the DNA, a little bit of DNA. They've got the tire tracks. They've got the motive, and that's really all they've got. Now, a month-long trial, what are we going to see in months and months of trial with that limited bit of evidence? I imagine the DNA expert is going to be a lot of testimony, and especially since the trace amounts of the DNA on the steering wheel is really what's going to come into play. And the defense, I, th I think, is going to argue something called secondary transfer. If you and I touch hands and then I touch the steering wheel, that's the secondary transfer of my DNA, or your DNA, rather, being on the steering wheel. There have been studies that that is the case, but they're very limited in their application. Yeah, and, and you, make, you are exactly right. That is what they're going to argue. At least I anticipate so, and I think that the defense's opening laid that out. Yeah. But 
to your point about the studies and limited application, that's where this trial gets long because experts are going yes. to be huge in this case. And mm -hmm. we always talk about in our trials the battle of the experts. Mm -hmm. So the prosecution will call a DNA expert to say what about the secondary transfer? What they're going to say is there is a study that if you, if you and I both touch this cell phone and then you touch the cell phone up against this desk, could my DNA be on this desk even though I didn't touch the desk? Yes, but it requires us to be both holding hands for about 30 seconds or maybe even two minutes. It, it's unrealistic in terms of how long you'd actually, actually have to hold hands for it to be secondary transfer. Yeah, so that's going to be really interesting testimony to listen to. The prosecution's expert to say that that's impossible. It would have to be holding hands like, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend walking down exactly. the street. And then later in the case, and this is one of the frustrations you and I both being on the defense side of different types of cases, you have to wait to put your expert on until maybe months from now. Is that why cross-examination for the defense is so important? Yeah, and also you're using the prosecutor's expert to become your own expert. Right. That's the best one. You could actually steal their expert by saying, this gentleman, their own expert supports my conclusions. Right. That's the best. Yeah, you make that list of admissions that you hope to get from their expert. We always say if you end a day in the other side's case feeling even just okay, you've had a good day, and then you get your chance a little bit later in the case to put on your evidence. So we know we're going to hear from DNA experts. We know we're going to hear from the people involved in the investigation. Do you anticipate a lot of, well, do you anticipate testimony from Merritt himself? I don't, because that's he's then going to have to defend his statements. Just a messy can of worms you're not going to open. Yeah, we'll see whether that can of worms get open. Ladies and gentlemen, this trial is going to be going on for a very long time, and you want to watch every minute of it here at the Law and Crime Network. I am signing off for today. Rachel Stockman will be sitting in this chair when you come back, and Brian will be hanging around to continue to discuss this interesting case. Have a great weekend.